What I'd like to do is take us through a journey and... Um, no, before I do that, let me, let me welcome first all the newcomers. If you're here visiting or looking for a, a church you'd like to know more, um, please come and see myself or one of the staff or the Connections team out in the desk afterwards. Love to talk to you about next steps. Uh, I was amiss not bringing that up. What I'd like to do is, every time I look at that picture, I don't know whether anyone else sees it. You're probably younger than me. Anyone remember Austin Powers? You either know it or you don't know it. Um, it's just an unfortunate angle of David. That's Michelangelo's David there. What I'd like to do is just really um, hone in from the life of this, uh, at this stage for this message today, this young man, and how there's so much we can be learning. I'm not one to do, let's do the New Year's series. Let's, let's have the vision message, you know, um, all that sort of stuff. There's a time and place for that, but not here, not now. What I'd like to do is talk into um, the lessons that we can learn from this space in our space, in our place, in our cultural moment right now. We're two or three years away now from COVID, uh, the implications of all that. But the, the residual impact of all that has been hanging around. But what I notice is that many people um, have been drawing a line and saying, that day is done. It's taken a while, a lot longer than we hoped, but they're saying now it's time to move on. It's time to reset. And um, what we noticed in, in life is that pre-COVID, it began a year or two pre-COVID in church world, things started to shift and change, there was something going on, COVID accelerated all that. But then we came out of COVID and a lot of people had been released from cultural captivity of church. They'd been taken off rosters and, and suddenly no one knew whether they were there or whether they were just watching online. Oh, I was watching online, brother. And, uh, and so suddenly the circuits were broken and, and things were happening. And many people pre-COVID had lived a life with very little margin in their life. They were, they were, they were getting tired um, looking for the value add and the value proposition of what, what am I putting in and how is this all working? But they were given the chance then to opt out. And, um, but what we found is people have grabbed that margin, a big margin in their life. And they said, I'm not letting go of that easily now because I'm very aware that someone can get on the news at any night of the week and say, we're in lockdown again. Or something can change in the global economy and interest rates shoot up X amount of percent per month. Suddenly there's a housing crisis, suddenly food's too dear and, and all these things are shifting and changing and we don't want to let go of that margin too easily with, with legitimate reason. And yet we've come through those, those years now and people are, are reassessing and going, hang on, what if we had a fresh start? What would I do? What would I do now if church world was new for me? What would I do in my work life? Based on what matters to me most, what, how would I restructure my life, my diary, my finances, my time, my relationships, based on life, real life? Would I invest that margin that I have uh, into something different, into what's, what's important? Because what we've noticed, and I think a few of us are feeling a residual sort of, I wouldn't say guilt, maybe an awareness, that in, in ensuring that that big margin in our life is back and we own that, is that we've slipped into an opportunism that says, whenever the opportunity is there, I'm taking a break. Whenever the opportunity is there, I'm out doing what I want, because I don't, next week it may not be there. So we're living in this margin and it's slipping into what could be described as, as subtle hedonism, uh, which is a pretty harsh word, but it just means my priority right now is to enjoy things. My, I'm gonna take this moment to have fun, I'm going to take this moment. And there's nothing wrong with having fun. Please have fun. I'm hoping church is fun. But when the priority becomes fun and not what matters most, whatever that we determine that to be, that gets a bit wearying in itself. We go, hang on, I'm a value-driven person. Most of us here are value-oriented people. What would it look like if I, if I reoriented my life around my values? So, but, what I, but I have noticed over recent years that not so many people are setting long-term strategic intent for their life. People aren't looking too far forward because it's almost like I set a plan and the world laughs at it and all the gears shift and everything moves and it's like, what the heck did I even bother for? And so we brought a much shorter term view into our life and the sort of plans that we're doing. It might be to get our kids through school in one spiritual piece. It might be to find our life partner, get your permanent residency visa. There's a whole bunch of people here getting through that to get the pay rise I deserve or, or to keep my marriage together. It's much more tangible right now sort of stuff that we're trying to get our lives uh, sorted out for. 
And not all dreams are even as lofty as that list that I just gave. Some just want to find a friend, any friend, a friend who will just know me and wash my back. Some want to get healthy again. Um, there's all sorts of things that people have their minds concerned about. But is it value-driven? So my question for us all to consider, and this isn't my question for you, it's your question to consider before yourself and your family and God, is what's actually driving your life? What is it that owns you? What, what's, what's setting the agenda for your time? And don't just bounce off that, because most of us will be able to answer very quickly what our values are and what matters most, and I'll tell you, I can tell very quickly by what your diary is set to, but that's none of my business. It's your life. But what I'd like us to do is just reconsider again, where did that come from? Where did that value come from? Did I inherit that value? Do I question that value? Is it valid? Is it God's value? Is it the world's value? Who determines where I head with this life that I have? And our life's direction is the sum total of all the issues in our life that drive us or oppose us. Some of those are internal, where there's values, there's desire, there's fear. Many of us are driven by fears. There's beliefs, they play a part. Some of them are external. Some of the things we can't control, the laws of the land, our culture, uh, the opportunities that may or may not come. But what, makes, what might surprise you as it surprised me, as I studied the life of this man, David, when I first became a Christian at the age of 19, because it was very easy going from a, from a non-Christian to a Christian setting. What you believe must be what you do. Rules-oriented, wasn't it? It was a moral grid that I, that I walked into. What you believe determines what you do. And, and few of us would argue that. But what I found is, like with David, he believed some things. He didn't do them. He didn't believe for a second that what he did with Bathsheba, that whole carry-on that happened there, if you know the story, was right and moral and just before God. He knew that was wrong, but he did it anyway. Why? Because you valued something else more. Sometimes we believe things very strongly, but we don't live by those beliefs. And that's a terrible thing when you realise that's the way I've lived. So our values drive us hugely, but your, even your values, the things, the things that you hold dear that are your most valuable thing, can be eroded by the culture that we live in as well. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Don't be deceived. Bad company corrupts good character. Bad company. Now, bad company is not necessarily the friends we hang around. It, it, it definitely talks about that. But bad company is on my phone. When I open my phone and I start scrolling through social media, bad company can corrupt good character. Who's bombarding my soul? The, the, the values of media. What do I see on the news every night? Or what am I watching? Bad company can erode good character. It's resetting my values based on the values of someone else who may want to get something from me or reset the way I spend my money to buy something or do something or, or erode my moral code, whatever it would be. Who's setting the agenda here? Who do I let set that agenda here? Some of us have inherited incredibly good values. We have people here from Australia, South Africa, Asia, uh, Middle East, all sorts of inherited values based on a moral code that fit in the Bible. We've seen it there. We've seen the verse. But is the proportion of my value for those things the same value that Jesus would say, here's what matters most? Because he said, love God first as the primary value. So how's my diary worker in that? And love people. And that'll over, one will overflow from the first. So is my diary, my life, my career, my ambition, my passion, my wallet, my all that stuff, is it set by those values? Or is it set by something that's admirable? Family, provision, being a good person, they're good things. Are they set by that? And do those things trump this thing? Because it's easy to justify. I can pour 80 hours a week into my career because I make double the amount of money, provide for my family, but Jesus said, how's the love for me working out? Because that's what matters most. Take care of that and all this gets sorted out. Both are justifiable. Which one's inherited? Which one's been allowed to be questioned and so on? So what I want to do is glean some massive principles from the life of David who was facing in his day similar things to what we're facing in our day. Very different context. There was no mobile phones. But his religious culture that he lived in was watery at best, 
it was, it was pretty fluid what was going on back then. No one carried the Bible around. No one could read. They knew about this God character, but they, but they didn't know how to live in accordance with that. So the, the religious scene wasn't what we tend to think it would be. He lived in a moment where they feared losing what they would get. Sounds like us, doesn't it? It's like, are the interest rates going to go up? Should I get a higher margin in, in, in my mortgage to get further ahead before I spend and invest in anything? Maybe I need to book this holiday in first, you know, all this sort of stuff. They were fearing the little, they would lose the little that they had. They, they were fearing being killed. Uh, most of us don't face that one. They lacked any real example of godly leadership. So it was a bit of a fluid setting. And so we look back at it very romantically, like a statue. That, it, it, was, it was pretty rough back then. It was, the, the, they, the back page of the book wasn't written for them. They didn't know how life was going to work out. They didn't know how long they were going to live. It could be all over tomorrow. So in that situation, one young guy, 16 years old, one young guy stands up with any real grit of what's right and wrong coming from anyone else in his culture and he changes the world. One young man changes the whole world by making a courageous choice based on what was going on inside that little ticker. From all we can gather, he didn't pray about it. The Bible doesn't tell us he did, but he made choices and I'm going to bring out some of those choices over the next few weeks that he made based on just raw value and those choices reformed the world that he lived in. He wasn't because of his intelligence, his education, any of that. His standing in life, just raw courage, simple value, change the world. And we can do the same thing. So today I want to use the story of Goliath and uh, I'm going to presume a lot that most of us have some grid of understanding of David and Goliath. We mentioned that story, little guy, big guy, one rock, dead guy. It sort of happened pretty quick. We, you know, cut to the chase, Goliath loses the day. Great drama for Sunday school. But there's 3,000 years later, the same lesson that drove that and changed his world can change our world today. So let me give some context and look at some similar elements that are in the mix for us. His day, the politics was unstable and uh, proving ineffective. So we know this, governments uh, aren't what we would all hope at the best of times. There'd just been a referendum in David's time. Just been a referendum. It was a bit one-sided, got to say, but they kicked out the whole judges system and they brought in a kingship, a kingdom, and the king wasn't much chop. King Saul was a bust uh, for a, a few reasons that we'll look at in a minute, but the kingdom idea wasn't working out too well either. He hadn't brought any real order, hadn't brought any security, that was still the way it always was. So politics was not, not much help for them. Religion uh, was unstructured, decentralised, not personal. People didn't have a relationship with God. They just tried to live like they were Yahweh's people in some broad way. Like us, uh, the local people, they just wanted to get by. They, you know, the threat was someone's going to come and take their farm, going to kill their kids, kill them. They just, they just wanted to be left in peace. Anyone relate to that? God, can I just, can someone just leave, just leave me alone, right? It's just like, I just want to have a good day. A good week would be gold. Um, and yet these crises still come at us. Uh, in his day, like ours, there was global insecurity. No one knew who was going to win the day. Nations rose, nations fall. There was sabre rattling going on, just as there is today, and it was all there. So interestingly, this setting with David and Goliath was in a very similar setting, give or take a few kilometres, as what we're seeing right now in this day with the same people. Israel versus Philistines, Israel versus Palestine. The, the area in which this battle took place with Goliath was only a few kilometres from where Gaza, the line of Gaza and Israel are now negotiating. Very different uh, posture now. But it's the same people, same battle. I mean, if only that soil could talk, right? Uh, the things that it's seen. In this day where we pick it up, Israel was definitely on the back foot and they had everything to lose and nothing to gain. The best they could do and that wasn't even possible really, was that they would hold their ground and survive the day. But they're lined up against the army of the Philistines. The Philistines have already won the propaganda war, the social media war. Um, no, no one thinks Israel can win. Um, they're so confident they send their guy out, Goliath. This guy's a piece of work. They're so arrogant about it. They go, we'll just send one guy out and you're going to lose heart. We're going to win the day. So it was a real moment for Israel. It was a, it was a bad day. And, uh, and we're going to pick the story up and see how it all turned around. All right, it's 1 Samuel 17, 4 to 7. And there, so picture two lines coming up, two lines of, of warriors. They're only 100 metres or so apart. If you see the Google Earth view of this, this scene, it's all very tight. 
Uh, they're very close. They could probably smell each other. They could, they could see their whites of each other's eyes. And they came out from the camp of the Philistines, a champion named Goliath of Gath. Gath was just a few kilometres away in a region that was only a few kilometres uh, in radius, whose height was six cubits and a span. For um, in us, that's about nine, nine and a half feet tall. So this guy was a unit. He made the rock look like a pebble. And um, he was just the beast. He had a helmet of bronze on his head and he was armed with a coat of mail. So if you picture chain mail, but not as refined as the, the, the knights used to wear, just big chunky stuff. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. So that equals 68 kilograms. So if anyone here is, is um, 70 kilos or lighter, that was sitting on him just as his shirt. And he had, a, he had bronze armour on his legs and a javelin of bronze. Slung, so that's his spare weapon slung between his shoulders, so the, a big metal rod with a spiky end on it. The shaft of his spear that he actually held um, was like a weaver's beam. So that's three inches round, 75 millimetres round, two or three metres long, and he's just hefting that thing, no problem at all. The shaft of his spear was like a, a weaver's beam. Sorry, the spear's head weighed 600 shekels. That's seven kilograms. So just the end of that spear. So that sucker, whatever it hits, that's going right through it and whatever's behind it as well. And his shield bearer went before him. If I was a shield bearer, I'd be behind him. Hey, it's like, this guy's a mobile weapons platform. It's like a US carrier group sailing through the ocean. Just keep away from this guy. So 70 kilogram or so David, who's just a 16-year-old young lad, he wasn't going to move the life by force. Um, and it would have been easier, I think, if Goliath would have been just this timid, shy, gentle giant. But he was aggressive, he was angry, he was energetic, and he was looking for trouble. Looking for trouble. So we pick it up in verse 8. It says, He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? He was, he was being sarcastic. Am I not just a Philistine, and, and are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. For 40 days, the Philistine came forward and took his stand morning and evening. Okay, so we know that story, most of it. Picture Saul in his tent. So he's there. He's in a no-win situation. There's no positive way this is going to end for him. He's outgunned. No one believes he can win. He doesn't believe he can win. So what do you do when you face a no-win situation? Because you and I are facing no-win situations every day of the week. Many of us, this is the biggest issue in our life right now is we feel like we're in a no-win situation. If he, if he goes one way and surrenders, he'll probably die. If he, if he doesn't surrender and fight, he's going to die. So what does he do? Nothing. He just sits there and listens to this guy taunting for 40 days, holding off the inevitable that's going to come. And we can have the same sort of feeling, the Goliaths of our life just taunt us and go, you're facing a no-win situation. If you're a young person trying to get into the housing market right now, Goliath is screaming at us, there is no way into that. Interest rates and housing prices are going up so fast. So what do we do? We say, I've got to work harder. Don't you realise how much this matters? I've got to double the amount of hours I work or get a second or third job to cope with that. I either work hard or we starve. It's a no-win situation. So what do we do? We compromise. We compromise our values for time with family and with God because we feel like we've got a no-win situation. Goliath's in front of us telling us what reality really is in Goliath's eyes. My boss might be a tyrant. What do I do? If I, there's no jobs out there, I can't afford to quit. I've got to submit to this person. I might be a young person looking for a spouse. I just want to get married and settle down, but every one of the youth groups is a drop kick or a drop out. How am I going to find anyone who follows God in this situation? So we compromise. Why? Because there's no option here. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? The problem's too big. You're too small. It's over for you. And we say, what else can I do? What else can I do? In the absence of God showing up and doing a miracle, I'll do what I have to do. I'll do what I need to do to survive and get my needs met. It's gotten quiet now. But what I found, something changes when we make that statement. Something changes spiritually 
when we commit to that path. And even though we have a belief in God and we've acknowledged God's existence, we've also claimed his impotence in this situation or his unwillingness to work, which is even worse. And we become practical atheists. In practice, we don't believe in God. In practice, we're doing what we can do. We're doing what our strength can muster up because we feel choiceless. So we help ourselves. But we've limited God because we don't make room for his answer, which doesn't look like the answers that we're looking for. We're looking for A or B, but he's always got C. He always does. The king always has the last move in any game of chess. And God always reserves the right to have the last move. And when we commit in the absence of faith in that to a life of compromise, it's so rare that I can't remember and I look a lot and I've looked for a long time and I'm, maybe it does happen, but I haven't seen it happen. When we, re, when we make a choice to compromise, I haven't seen God invade that situation and do the thing that we were hoping he would do before we did that. Once we take that out of, our, out of that landscape and we say, I'm choosing a path that's relying on me, that's relying on compromise, we've effectively said to God, out, I'll take care of this. I've got this in whatever way it is. We say things like, if God gives me more money, I'll be generous, I'll stay at home more. But no extra money ever comes. If God gets rid of my boss, I'll dedicate myself more to the work that he's given me. But that crummy boss stays there. The situation seems, seems to stay the same. And so it just confirms the decision that we've already made. And it was into this very mindset that got Saul into trouble as well. This is why he got into this mess in the first place. It was only a few days or weeks before this, and it's a few chapters in, in uh, the book of Samuel, where he approached a battle and, and he was told, mate, the battle's coming, it's going to be tough, but if you just wait for me, Samuel told him, wait for me, I'll be seven days and I'll offer the sacrifice. Don't do anything until I do that. You know, it, was, it was really clear. The seven days came and, and Saul's in this predicament. His, his army are deserting. They're, going, they're looking at the size of the battle against them, going, we're out of here. Different army, different, different situation, but they're gone. They're leaving. And Saul goes, what am I going to do? I've got no choice. They're all going. We're going to lose this thing unless I do something myself. It's either, you know, I do it or we lose. Two options, both of them wrong. If I don't compromise, all is lost. And God took this dynamic so seriously for this poor guy. It carries on in 1 Samuel 13, 13. God, Samuel said to Saul, you've done foolishly if you had not kept the command of the Lord your God with, with which he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him, to be the prince over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded. Now that's pretty heavy. And that's old, old Testament, you know. But the principle still seems to hold true. But back to David, this man that is after God's own heart. He's still only 16, as I've said. Saul's eyes on that day were full, full of a giant, full of an army. David's eyes at 16 were full of God. He couldn't see the problem because all he could see was God, because that's all he'd ever looked at all his life. That's all that mattered to the young kid. And what we behold sets our agenda. What we look at sets where we're going to go. God didn't tell David to kill that giant. He didn't have to. Nor did he tell David to build a temple, but he had to, because of what was going on inside of here. Many of our prayers for guidance, we, we, would, we wouldn't pray them. We wouldn't need them if our heart was driven by the heart of God and what, what he values. Our choice, our choice landscape would be completely different. So the obvious question is for all of us, I guess, um, are my values forming my life? Where are my values coming from? Uh, are you driving life or is life driving you? But the mistake we can feel is that, we're, is that we're choiceless. Don't ever feel choiceless when it comes to living by a moral code. We always have the choice, but we just going to need to consider the ramifications of that choice, huh? It might, it might cost you your wealth. It might cost you your job. It might cost you a relationship. It might cost you your life. But you have a choice. 
What do you live for? What do you die for? And some of us here, I know, have had guns to your head and you've had to make choices. In that moment, what am I prepared to die for? And you've been able to answer it in an instant. If only we could live every day like that. But sometimes we let the presence of fear be the signal for us to stop. What if I go broke? What if I retire and there's not enough money in the bank? What if this about my kids? What about what if I get sick? Oh, and, and fear becomes a trigger for us to make a decision in response to that fear. And even though I'm value-driven, or even David was value-driven, he still would have had that fear. I can't imagine he would look at Goliath and go, he would have been worried. His heart rate would have gone up 10, 20, 30, 100 beats a minute. He was determined he was going there, but he would have been a bit scared. He would have had to manage that in his life. And we experience this fear, anxiety rises, adrenaline flows. <gasps> we all know that sort of feeling about something. But in the fear, it's fear. Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage says, I do what I know I should do in the very midst of that fear. Right as I'm feeling this anxiety, I am going that way, even if it kills me, you know. Courage is not the absence of fear. And, and the Holy Spirit, when he's driving our life, he is called the encourager. Why? Because he gives courage, courage within. He gives us that courage, the courage of conviction. And now's the time for Christians, all of us. The world's not interested in what you believe. It's interested in what matters. What matters to you people, you Christian people? Do people matter? Do the defenceless people matter? They can see it. They don't need to hear what we, what we say. They're watching what we do. What matters to you guys? And if they see courage, if they see values, just show them courage and they'll follow you. Show them faith and they'll come behind you. Someone stands up one day and changes the world by one decision of faith. Any choice that's made from fear that determines your life direction will find a way to be the wrong decision. Ultimately, it, will, it might alleviate fear for a moment, but it'll end up being the wrong decision. But when our values overlap with God's values, it, it's all different. Everything changes. Anything's possible. God can do anything and he probably will because our life is lining up with his life and where his life is, there is provision. Suddenly the ticking talk the ticking clock, the ticking clock of life no longer matters where we're worried about, if I don't fix this by now, I'm going to do without. Or, you know, we're not worried about, because now panic is replaced by perseverance. Fear has gone, uh, sorry, fear has gone and faith comes in its place. It's, it's a whole switching. When I, when I determine to live my life in accordance with what matters most, suddenly very little matters. Very little matters to me anymore. And suddenly the power of God comes into that situation. Suddenly provision comes that you could never make up on your own. Suddenly miracles happen that you couldn't ever have dreamed of before because you're focused on the one thing that matters. And it's the thing that God takes seriously as well. Suddenly the praying wife sees her family saved. Suddenly the man who's longing for meaning in his life sees, a, sees his city and a country and a, and a world changed because he's followed his convictions. And the world is just hungry to find someone who believes in what they're doing, a cause worth fighting for. It's a life worth living. So an unarmoured teen, a little teenager, topples a seasoned and unbeatable warrior. It was never about his size. It was never about his skill. It was about aligning his life with the agenda of God for that moment and letting God do the rest. So when we're value-driven, that's when we can impact the world. The question we've got to ask is, do I want to? Does it matter? I don't think we really go away and go, well, I really want to change the world. Most of us don't go to sleep at night thinking, oh, how can I change the whole world? We just want to live our life. We just want to be faithful with this life that we've got. But the intersection of all this comes when we say, am I living the life I'm made for, I'm designed for, or am I, am I prepared to live a life of compromise? And then just keep going with that. Why was David so confident? One stone, one shot. And he was pretty cocky about it. Have a look at it in 1 Samuel 17. The Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you'd come to me with sticks? 
and the Philistine cursed David by his God. He, 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 like, he's as tall as I am on this stage, looking down at a little runt going, is this what you're going to bring me, you know? And then David responds, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. I love this guy. I'm going to cut your head off, man. Like he was, considering the company he was in, honestly, and I'll give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistine. He just, he just takes it up a grade. He doubles down. I'm not just, it's not just you. We're going to take you all out. You guys, dead man walking. He's a little runty guy. Like, where did this come from? And I'll give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And that... So he's not, he's not saying that they'll know that Israel's strong, that I'm a good warrior, that they'll know that God's fighting this fight. He's done this and he's going to get the glory. Because at the end of the day, isn't that all that we want from our life? Isn't that all we want? If we think about it hard enough. God, we just want you to be glorified through my life. Just take, just let people see you in me. And that's all David wanted. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. How did he get so arrogant about that? Well, this wasn't the first time he'd relied on God. At 16, he'd already lived many years out in the field and protecting his father's sheep, and he'd try to explain to Saul who couldn't quite see the, the forest for the trees. Hey, mate, don't worry about it. When, when a bear's come and attacked the sheep, I just chase this thing down and skin it alive. When a lion comes, no problem. Take it down. I'd love to see that on YouTube. How do you do that, you know? And then he, he just takes his shot. It's almost like one of those YouTube clips. Like I, the, the goal's back there. He just goes, throws the ball, and there it is. Because God had his control of this pebble. And he'd seen God work. He'd seen him work before. And so this isn't a matter of, well, I've got to take a leap that's, that's so far I can't comprehend it. There may well be steps that we can take for our life today, right now, that are small steps. Relatively small for David was just killing a bear with his bare hands, you know, when he was probably 10 years old. I don't know. But what's our small step? Where we live according to our value. Where we look at our, our diary, we look at our bank account, we look at how many hours I spend at work, we look at how, many, how much time we spend with our family, and we say, what, what matters here? How do I need to recalibrate that so that that which matters most gets the time first? That I live from the first fruits of my life with my finances and my time and all those sorts of things because the first fruits principle is the God principle, that God gets what's first, not what's left over. So as you enter 2024, do your values align with God's values? Again, your question is not, you don't owe me the answer to that, but Jesus offers abundant life and that life is not found in a life of compromise. A compromised life is not abundant life. It's just breathing. It's just trying to get to the end game with as least amount of pain as possible. But that's not living. It's just existing. So what are your values? Ask yourself, what are they? What are my values and why are they my values? Do they reflect values that really matter or have I just inherited them and I haven't questioned them for the longest time? I'll just invite the band up and, and we're just, I just want us to pray because I don't, I don't have the right to probe into your personal life that you do and your, your spouse does if you have a spouse here today and, and God certainly does. He's either God or he's not. He's Lord or he's not. You can't, you can't have a proportional God. You've got him all if you've got nothing. Jesus is only Lord. What does that mean for me with my values? Let's close our eyes and pray into that for a moment. Father, I just want to lift the load of guilt or condemnation. We haven't got room or time or need for that. That serves no purpose. Father, you want your people to be free. You want your people to be full of life and power. And that power comes when we're aligned with what you have designed us for. Freedom. Freedom. Freedom from the worry of money. Freedom from the worry of people's opinions. Freedom from fear of anything. Free to live. Free to love people. Free to love God with all I have. If I haven't got that, I've got nothing. So Lord, show us the path to that. Lord, is there anything in our life 
that's hindering that? Is there an area of my heart where I've compromised, where I've accepted such a lesser thing because I didn't believe you to provide what I need the most? Father, give me the grace today to turn my back on that, to break that agenda, to break that relationship, to break that fear, whatever it is that's got the label of compromise over it. Father, give me the grace and the faith to walk away from that and not look back. And Lord, I pray you'd give each of us courage as we leave this place and we look at 2024. No one's ever lived this year before. It can look like something wildly different to what 2023 looked like. The whole world might get changed tomorrow because a couple of hundred people made a brave choice to love their neighbour. Father, give us all that we need to be your people. And Lord, in that freedom, in the, in the freshness and the breath of that freedom, we celebrate who you are because Jesus is Lord. And Lord, you are Lord of our life. And we aren't who we truly meant to be if things are any other way. We celebrate that freedom in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, everyone. Let's worship.